Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Bruce Delmonico, Assistant Dean for Admissions here at the Yale School of Management. Thank you for attending this online reception that we're hosting here on campus in New Haven, uh, hoping to give you the opportunity to learn more about Yale SOM and some of the things we feel differentiates us from other top MBA programs. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Kristen Byers. Um, yes. Want to say hi? Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here today. I am privileged to lead our community and inclusion efforts at the school and happy to co-host today with Bruce. Thank you. So we have um, some set remarks that we'd like to make. It may take about 20 minutes of the, the time we have together. Uh, I think we have an hour, so it's, uh, it's noon now in, in, on the east coast of the US. We'll be done by 1 PM. The first part, we'll be uh, talking a little bit about the school, and then we'd like to open it up for question and answer, so just to answer anything that's on your mind as you're looking to learn more about Yale SOM and thinking about um, applying for our, our full-time MBA program. Um, so I'd love to start uh, where we start with everything having to do with Yale SOM, which is with the mission uh, to educate leaders in, for business and society. That's the founding mission of, of the school, and it's central to everything we do here. Uh, and it means lots of things. It's very much a broad, multi-sector mission. Um, but it, it definitely means that we want our students and graduates to think so broadly about um, the impact they can have, and think broadly about the challenges we face in an increasingly complex world. Um, and um, we want to educate leaders who can be um, decision makers in environments where um, there are multiple stakeholders, there are complexities, uh, and environments uh, at play. And so the mission is very much at the core of what we do here at Yale. Um, Supporting the mission and kind of undergirding the mission, we have three objectives that we feel really informs what we do at Yale uh, and makes uh, the experience here at Yale SOM for you as a student very distinct and very different from what you ex might experience at, at other uh, top business schools. The first is uh, we feel that we are the most integrated business school to our home university. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, having a, a university like Yale to be part of is a rarity and something that we very much value. And we try to take advantage of that, to leverage that as much as possible. So as an example, um, when you start at Yale SOM, um, you, um, you take a core curriculum in the first year of a two-year program. Uh, but the second year is entirely electives. And you can take those electives anywhere at Yale without limit. And they will count towards your graduation. Uh, so you can, in addition to the courses we offer at SOM, you take courses at the law school, school of forestry, public health, drama architecture, even Yale College, lots of students will take uh, language classes. They'll take, you know, you can take a class with Stanley McChrystal uh, at the Jackson Institute. Um, so really, the entire university is open to you academically. And that, that, that permeability, as it were, uh, translates not just to the academic experience, but to conferences, to clubs, uh, to, to ways to connect across the university more generally. And then it does continue into your alumni experience. So as an alumnus or alumna, um, when, you, when you graduate, you have access not just to the Yale SOM alumni network, but to the broader Yale alumni network, which is a great resource to have and really allows you to tap into the, 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 uh, the, the network of not just Yale SOM, but Yale College, the undergraduate, and the other professional graduate schools. So I think that's a real advantage to us here at, at Yale. Um, the second objective uh, is to be the most global US business school. Um, and again, lots of business schools um, aspire to have a global component to uh, their experience. But we feel that we've um, gone beyond that and really tried to create uh, a, an environment and, a, and an experience that is, is truly global. It takes on many different forms. It can be you know, when you look at the, the composition of our student body, 45% you know, you know, or so have uh, international passports. When you look at the, the cases that we're taught in the curriculum, um, there are the protagonists. They're not just US-based cases, but they're international cases. But I think in terms of the, the global experience, um, we've built out uh, a set of opportunities uh, that is unique among top US business schools. It's not just a lot of schools have one-to-one -one partnerships. We've built out what we call our, our global network for advanced management, 30 top schools on six continents, uh, and, 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 and really tried to create a network model as opposed to a partnership model that is multifaceted and allows you um, to connect in, in real time with, with uh, peers and colleagues from around the globe. Uh, and, and we've, to support that, uh, the school has developed, along with the global network, so a platform of opportunities uh, that you can choose from to uh, fulfill what we call our, our global stage requirements. So when you come to Yale SOM, um, one of the academic requirements is you, you complete one of these global stage requirements. A number of them flow from 
the global network, the, the global network weeks, the global network courses, but we also have an international experience course, which is the, the first number there, um, that is uh, internal to Yale SOM and is uh, a, a study trip that you will take with 20 or so of your classmates led by a faculty member. Uh, we also have experiential courses, numbers four and five there, uh, global social entrepreneurship, and uh, um, I guess global social entrepreneurship is the, the main one, and we have also have a semester-long exchange, number five. So there's a menu of options that you can choose from um, to, to, to fulfill the global studies requirement, but the, whole, the idea behind it is that we, we want you to think globally, we want you to be oriented globally. We feel like that will make you a more eff effective and successful leader after you graduate, and that really does inform much of what we do uh, at the Yale School of Management. And so that's an important part of the experience as well. And then the third objective, uh, what we say is to, to, it's to be the best source of elevated leaders across all regions and sectors. And this is kind of, a, kind of an ambiguous thing, but it really gets down to um, the integrated curriculum uh, and the distinctiveness of that. So again, when you come to Yale, our, our core curriculum teaches you know, many of the same concepts you will get at other courses, but they're organized or oriented differently uh, than you will experience uh, elsewhere. And we feel like as though this will prepare you more effectively to be a successful leader after you graduate than, um, it, you, than if you were taking a curriculum, uh, the same curriculum elsewhere, or a core curriculum elsewhere. Um, and just to give an example of that, so our courses are not taught according to functional silos, they're taught according to what we call organizational perspectives, these are our core courses. Um, and these perspectives are very broad, very interdisciplinary, they draw on a number of different areas, not just uh, just a narrow, you know, functionally discrete area. Um, there's team teaching that happens there, and they are taught according to our, our raw cases, which is a unique case method that we teach at, at Yale SOM um, that we've developed in-house that support the, the, the organizational perspectives courses. And we feel it'll give you much more real-world experience as you're taking the course, because the raw cases, the case writing team does not sort of distill down and condense the, all the relevant information for you and do that work for you, but you get all the primary source materials that you would see in the real world. And we feel that really allows you to develop skills um, in terms of how to think, synthesize, analyze information um, that you wouldn't get in other MBA programs because you're not asked to do that work. But at the core of, it, though, of this uh, are the organizational perspective courses. Again, they are the interdisciplinary nature. Uh, taking sourcing and managing funds as one example, this is sort of the CFO function. Um, you'll see that it includes not just finance, but there's strategy, operations, accounting, a number of different disciplines that come together and are taught there. And again, the idea is to teach the course from the perspective of that particular stakeholder to get you thinking broadly about the different disciplines, the different areas of an organization you need to think, that you need to have in mind, that you need to consider as you're representing that, that stakeholder. Um, so again, we try to, to try to make it much more real world, much more interdisciplinary, uh, and I think much more effective way to, to prepare you to be uh, a, sort of a, a, a professional and then and ultimately leader uh, in the 21st century. I would mention one last thing about, so that I mentioned the raw cases. One nice aspect of the raw cases is that those cases can recur in multiple courses so you can see how the same set of facts can take on different meaning depending on what kind of perspective, stakeholder perspective you're undertaking. And because they're so interdisciplinary, I think I, I did mention this, um, the, the courses are um, team taught. Uh, so you'll see professors from other, from different disciplines, different, with different levels of, uh, different expertises in, in the course uh, together. So it's a little bit about what the curriculum is about. Um, and again, that is one aspect of, I think, what makes us uh, different from other business schools in addition to being so connected to Yale, being so global, and then having this unique uh, uh, integrated curriculum. I think that those are among the differentiators. Obviously, the community is an important thing as well and is, is central to what we do here at Yale. And I would like to pass off to Kristen to talk a little bit, a bit about the community. Yeah, absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit, I'm excited to talk about, give you a quick snapshot of what we think makes our community really special and unique. Um, so it really is the people, which includes students across all of our degree programs, our faculty and staff that sort of come together and align with the mission that Bruce just talked about um, and are really interested in each other's pursuits. Um, so it makes for this really welcoming and collaborative environment. Um, and on the admissions perspective, we're really thoughtful around crafting a class that's um, purposely diverse in so many different ways. So not only in demographics, but also in experiences um, and perspective and interest as well. And that really enriches not only the classroom experience, but um, some of the pictures that you just saw um, cycling through there in terms of the way that our students get involved in the community. Um, so whether that's um, you know, through social extracurriculars, there are some athletic pictures there, um, conferences that our student clubs host, et cetera. 
Um, so I could go on and on, um, but I just wanted to highlight a, a few things that I think make our community um, sort of unique, um, and you might not find in other uh, business programs as well. Um, so one of the, the ways the community gets together is every Thursday, we, um, the whole school hosts a, so what we call a closing bell, which is essentially um, a time for some, some food and drink and celebration at the end of the week um, to kick off the weekend, as we don't have classes officially on Fridays. Um, and the nice thing about this is our various student clubs take turns co-hosting this event throughout the year. So um, for instance, when the Veterans Club gets to host, they tend to bring a pull-up bar and, and host a friendly competition um, among, among goers of, of the closing bell. Um, I saw this year our Latinx Club is hosting a celebration for Dios de los Muertos on October 31st, which is also Halloween um, in the US. So um, lots of fun ways there. Um, we have, I talked a little bit about our clubs. We have over 50 uh, student clubs, huge engagement and activity in all of them. These are inclusive networks, which everyone is encouraged um, to join. You don't have to be a member of a certain affinity to join. Um, and another unique uh, factor about Yale is that all of these clubs are free for you to join. So there's no charge. Um, and so there's great engagement across affinities and there's great allyships for some of our diverse clubs. So I looked at the numbers recently and over 80% of our student body overall is an active member of our six um, diverse affinity clubs. Um, so great engagement there. Um, one other thing I just want to quickly highlight is um, there's a lot of safe spaces on campus for, for folks to share their story and, and share perspectives and, and learn with each other in a, in a safe and welcoming environment. Um, so two things I'll point out here. One, there is a weekly event called Voices, um, which happens every Monday evening on campus throughout the year. Um, and it, uh, it's a student that volunteers to share his or her story. Um, it's very personal, um, very authentic, um, and has a great showing um, each week of people that are curious to learn more. Um, and in a, in a similar uh, vein, we have something called Ask Me Anything, um, or AMAs as we, as we abbreviate it. Um, and these happen monthly throughout the year, and they're a really amazing opportunity to learn about um, difference um, and to learn about people's different affinities. Um, and so there are ways that people volunteer to share something about a piece of their identity um, that may be diverse or unique. Um, and there's typically themes that, that we lay out throughout the year. Um, and it's, again, cross community. So it's, it's students, faculty, and staff that tend to participate. And there's um, a variety of ways, anonymous and or not anonymous, that you can ask questions um, in a very non-threatening way uh, of each other. Um, and what's been really nice to see is relationships grow after the AMA happens. So if someone is sharing their story on an Ask Me Anything panel, um, we have free coffee vouchers that we'll provide to the panelists. And so students can go and ask that person for a coffee afterwards. Words. Um, so just a, a few quick things I wanted to highlight. Um, the last thing I'll just mention, um, shifting gears a little bit, um, is we have a fun year-long effort called the Internship Fund, um, which every year um, the whole community gets involved. And in that purpose is to support students that are interested in going into social sector, so nonprofit or government um, internships that aren't able uh, to pay a full MBA salary. So there's um, fundra fundraising efforts all year, um, including things like talent shows, um, as well. So lots of great ways that the community engages. So before we open it up to questions, and I know some are coming through, so thank you in advance, and we'll get to them um, in just a moment. We just wanted to close with some information about um, our admissions process and some of the components. Much of this you've probably been familiar with, um, and it's on our website, and you're um, preparing for, for multiple schools. So I did just want to mention um, two key things that might be a little bit unique here at Yale um, to give you a little bit insight into those. So the first one is video questions, um, which we've been doing now for a number of years. Um, and so after you submit your application and pay your, enroll, uh, your application fee, which is a sliding scale based on your salary, um, you'll get access to these video questions. And it's a set of three questions. It's by no means any trick questions. Um, we very much want you to succeed um, in this. And we just want another glimpse at, at who you are. So it's just another opportunity for you to tell your story and articulate um, your goals and interests. Um, and we also um, are looking at language skills in terms of the international student population as well. Um, and the, the best way to prepare for that, uh, there is a simulation tool that's offered within the platform. So we would just recommend to, to use a simulation tool and just to be yourself. 
um, as well. There's also a 20 to 30 second pause after we ask the, the particular question to let you collect your thoughts as well. Um, so don't be nervous. Um, and then the second thing which is new this year in terms of a requirement um, is something called the behavioral assessment, um, which we've partnered with ETS um, to administer. We've been piloting it for a number of years and found really good success um, in terms of correlation with academic success in the classroom. Um, so this is a, a quick, uh, it's a 20 minute online tool. There's no preparation you need um, in order to, to fill this out and complete the tool. And again, we want you to answer honestly and, and sort of be yourself. Um, and what it, it does, it, it measures a, a set of interpersonal and entrepreneurial, intrapersonal um, competencies um, to, that correlate with success um, as an MBA student. So we're excited about this. Um, it, we, you know, we of course rely on the more traditional methods of, of GPA and standardized test scores, um, but that doesn't always tell us everything we need to know about a candidate. So this may open the door for us to, to have more confidence um, in moving forward with folks that might not have the, the um, highest score, but we know would be successful here regardless. And then last, I just wanted to highlight um, our upcoming application deadlines for the coming year, um, also on our website um, as well. And then please note, um, we are partnered with the consortium. Um, and if you do um, align with the consortium's mission of elevating diversity in business and want to apply through the consortium, they have slightly different dates um, that we honor. So you would go directly through, through those dates instead of Yale's as well. All right, uh, so I think we can take this opportunity now. We're doing great on time. Um, so we have plenty of time to answer some questions. I'm just gonna pull some up that are coming through here. Okay, Bruce, I'm gonna kick you a few of these first ones. Okay. Um, so you talked about the global network yes. um, for advanced management. Um, so one of the questions is to speak more to the benefit of this network model versus a partnership model. Sure, happy to do that. So again, as I sort of mentioned in the, I can go back and maybe go back in slides. I don't know if this is going to be productive or not. Um, the, so the global network, it's going very far back. <laughs> Sorry. One more. So the global network for advanced management, so it's a network of 30 schools uh, on six continents. Um, so talking a little bit more about network versus partnership. Um, so in, 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 you know, other MBA programs in the States, when they want to reach out beyond the, the borders of the U.S., they, they tend to enter into a one-to-one you know, -one partnership agreement with um, another school, so elsewhere in, in the world. Um, it tends to be, you know, an exchange program. A lot of times it's actually at the executive level, so it doesn't even affect the full-time MBA students. Um, but even to the extent there are exchanges within the, the full-time MBA program, you know, it's the, the opportunity for you as a student in a U.S. school to go to a school outside the U.S. and be there for a semester or some period of time. Um, the idea is that it's very limited, um, and you get a perspective on one uh, sort of one culture, one one environment, um, and, and one school. Um, so the idea for the network is in that to uh, be able to connect students from the 30 global network schools together, uh, and to be able for you to connect with not just one students from one school, but students from sort of 29 other schools uh, across. A range of countries and continents. Um, and there is a, again, we have a portfolio of opportunities that allow you to do this. One, one of the most uh, prominent and I think most popular are called Global Network Weeks. So the idea there is that, uh, you know, during the fall or the spring, you, during break when you don't have, otherwise have classes, uh, so it doesn't interrupt and disrupt your, your, your course, coursework or your studies, um, you can go to um, one of the other participating global network schools, usually about 20 other participating global network schools in any particular global network week. And for that week, you can take course, courses from faculty from that um, program on an area you know, uh, of, of their expertise. So Technion in Israel is one of the global network schools, and they tend to do something called Startup Nation because there's very big entrepreneurship and innovation are very big uh, in, in, in Israel. So you learn about innovation, entrepreneurship from the Technion faculty. But you'll be in class with students from the other, say, 19 participating global network schools. So you're connecting not just with faculty and students from Technion, uh, but actually faculty and students from 20, you know, including Yale, 20, for example, uh, global network schools. And so it allows you to multiply those connections, multiply that learning, uh, and really form a network that is far beyond just that one school. Um, that's an example. All these other uh, global network school participating, participating global network schools will have courses that are specific to their 
areas of expertise. At Yale, we tend to do it on that sort of behavioral finance, behavioral economics, behavioral marketing, because uh, that's a big, you know, Bob Schiller uh, and others are, are here, and that's a big area of, of expertise. Um, in China, uh, the, the, or in, in uh, sort of Fudan, we can do um, doing, doing business in, in China. Um, you know, there are others uh, in Costa, uh, in, Kai in Costa Rica is uh, uh, focused on ecotourism, for example, uh, or has been. So there are lots of different opportunities that exist. Um, and one last thing I would say, I've gone on a bit at length, I apologize, is that um, when you come to Yale, you know, obviously these global opportunities, uh, I guess two other things I would say. When you come to Yale, um, these global opportunities uh, cost money, and so actually you, we have, you will get a global studies account uh, with, uh, that is funded for you to be able to uh, take part in one international experience trip or two global network weeks. So we know that this is a requirement that's not, you know, it's, it's not inexpensive, and so we try to make that as affordable for you as possible. So when you come to Yale, you get that account to help pay for these experiences. The other thing I would say that one of the ideas behind it the, 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 not just the network model, but the, the programming behind it, um, is that you know, students, we have always had exchange, special line exchange programs. In a two-year MBA program, that's a long time to be away from, from your, your school. And so we tried to create, the, as a school, we broadly, you know, uh, the faculty uh, and, and other parts of the staff, tried to create these more mo modular opportunities that existed to fit within your coursework so you didn't have to step away from Yale for a whole semester, but could, could get these experiences um, in, in places that didn't disrupt your, your study. So I think that's a lot of the theory behind um, this, these programs as well. Awesome, that's great. And I think you alluded to this, but um, there's a specific question around how does the global experience, if someone wanted to return mm. to the same fields, um, mm. career-wise, how would the global experience enhance their MBA experience? Return to the same field, sort of professionally, mm -hmm. um, that they were in before? Correct, um, so what's, what's, the, what's the ROI of this global? Piece of the curriculum. Yeah, that's a great question, and, it's, and it depends. So it, much like the Global Network Weeks, the international experiences do have different themes, uh, and they're focused on, on different things, and they, the countries change every year. China and India tend to be pretty durable in terms of destinations, and Japan as well, uh, and there, there are opportunities in, in all continents of so South America, Africa, uh, uh, Europe, um, and so, so um, it will depend on what the theme is for the, for the trip, so you might want to choose uh, a, a trip that is that is themed consistent with your your professional aspirations, um, and to the extent that's that's the uh, that's the case, that that should I would think would determine your choice for global experience trip or international experience trip. Um, but also geographically, obviously, if you're looking to work in uh, in so in South America, you know, going on that that trip would be more relevant to you. The, what these trips involve are, um, and just to step back, are largely visits to sort of business leaders, uh, government leaders, um, heads of NGOs and other, other organizations um, to get a sense of sort of the, the, the business, the legal, the regulatory context, the, the social context in, with, in which businesses operate uh, or organizations operate in different, different countries and different contexts. Again, the idea is to get, help increase your sensitivity to those differences and help you understand what they are, how different, different things, uh, you know, very, very general term things, different you know, enterprises operate differently in, 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 in those different contexts. And, that, and so the idea is to, on the higher level, to, to, as I said, increase your sensitivity to those issues so that you can then apply them wherever you are working, both geographically uh, and industry-wise. But to the extent the ge geography or the industry focus of the global, uh, the international experience trip is directly relevant to your professional aspirations, obviously that, that would be, I would think, an overriding consideration and where you choose to go. Great, thank you. Um, so some questions about the um, curriculum. Um, I, can, I can take a little bit, and if you want to chime in, sure. feel free. So questions around how, how the classes, the core classes are taught, um, whether it's a cohort, team model, all of that. Um, so we typically break the class into multiple cohorts. Um, so I believe we have five cohorts um, of about 70, 80 students per cohort. And then within that, we break it down farther um, in terms of really um, small, intimate learning teams of eight um, that you go through the core curriculum with. Um, so it's a really nice blend of, of having these sort of smaller learning teams and then a larger um, environment as well. Um, and that's specific to the first year core curriculum. Um, your second year is, is open up, um, as, as Bruce talked about, you can take electives at SOM or across the university. Um, and definitely the teaching method is a, is a lot broader um, and diverse depending on the, the nature of the, how the professor wants to teach that. Um, 
there is, you know, heavy on teamwork, team projects. Um, Bruce talked about the raw case method, um, which is a definite part of the core curriculum. Um, we also um, employ case, uh, cooked cases as well, um, so the more traditional case cases as well. So it is a, a mix of, of everything, I would say. Yeah. Um, from that perspective. Um, and then there's a really interesting question that came through around, is there um, sort of data or results that, mm -hmm. that um, back up this uh, integrated curriculum and, and why we're doing that? Um, so I, I have a quick point of view and then I might ask you to, to sure. jump in as well. Um, so in my prior life, I was an MBA recruiter um, hiring from all the different uh, top business schools at a consulting firm. Um, and I heard time and time again from uh, managing partners at the firm that they always needed a Yale SOM graduate on the team um, because they think differently, they pick their head up, they look across um, across silos, across geographies, um, and think about things more holistically. Um, so that's sort of qualitative data that we've gotten time and time again from our employers and our alumni um, that um, it, it, people think in a different way. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is, is Bruce talked about the raw case method. It is more practical. Um, so um, our students and our alums, we like to think, are able to kind of hit the ground quicker in a real business environment to be able to do that quick analytical work to sift through data. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And I would just uh, reiterate, I, you know, obviously hear that, uh, that point from the career development office as well, is that, you know, MBA recruiters, when they come here, they talk about wanting to have yellow SOM graduates on their teams, especially consulting firms, because of that, that broader perspective and sort of that outside the box thinking. Um, I think that's reflected, um, you know, to some degree in the in the, um, the clear report, you know, about a third of our graduates do go into consulting uh, as, as an industry and, you know, McKinsey and Bain are uh, among our top hires every year. And I think mm -hmm. that that speaks that speaks to that, that the value that they put in having SOM students uh, in, in their firms and on their teams. And it just in terms of the a little bit different aspect of it, the integrated curriculum and a little bit more historical perspective. So when the integrated curriculum was first rolled out, um, the faculty did, they wanted to make sure there was no loss of fidelity, as it were, in terms of the learning. And so they did do, they did um, uh, give assessments to the classes going through the, the, the traditional, the older curriculum. Uh, and, and then they gave this in terms of what they learned. And they gave the same assessments to the people who go th went through the, the integrated curriculum to make sure that their, you know, their, the learning was the same, what they were getting out of the experience was the same, and from a, just a from technical perspective, from the nuts and bolts perspective, obviously the value of the integrated curriculum is on top of that, that core learning, but making sure that, that core learning didn't suffer in the process, and they found obviously that it did, and we you know, continue to move forward with the integrated curriculum since then. Great. So there's a few questions around career development, um, career mm -hmm. development office and career development support. Um, so one of the questions was, does, does SOM support internship support um, for students? Um, absolutely. Um, there's a, a really great team of, I think, over 20 folks in our career development mm -hmm. office now um, that are um, well equipped um, and broken out into uh, employer expertise and career coaching expertise that service students. So um, all of our students go through a structured CDO curriculum, um, get partnered with um, sort of industry agnostic career coaches, um, and then um, also um, have the benefit of partnering with industry clubs and then the industry employer partnership uh, leaders as well in the CDO, um, once you know sort of where you want to focus in on. Um, we have a great number of employers coming to campus every year for both full-time um, and internship recruiting. Um, I believe that's on our website as well. Um, so, so lots of support there. Yep. Great. Um, so there's some admissions questions okay. that are coming through. Um, Shocking. <laughs> so one question was around how do we advise the GRE versus GMAT, and, and how does someone make that choice? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take that one. And um, and for a number of years, we've accepted both tests. And about, I would say, about a quarter of our applicants take the GRE as opposed to to the GMAT. Uh, I think we've gotten good at sort of comparing across the score, the 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 tests, and and getting a sense of, you know, what what comparable scores are uh, on the GMAT versus the GRE. It's true. We we say this and it's true that we don't have a preference for either test. Um, I think it would be unfair for us to to accept both, but then prefer one. I don't think that that would be the, uh, the right, right way to approach it. Um, and in terms of the, the rate of admission, you know, it, it is roughly comparable um, to the, the rate at which people apply. 
uh, to the school with with uh, from, with the various tests. So it, I think that shows that we are kind of treating them equally. Um, in terms of choosing which one to, to take, they, I mean, they are structured a little bit differently, and in the grand sense, they are you know you know very similar. Uh, but the types of questions that are asked um, and, and the, the, the ways you will uh, to take the test are a little bit different. And so I think one thing to do if you're unsure about which one you want to take is to maybe do some sample questions from each uh, and maybe just kind of understand the, the structures of the, of the, of the test and, and then do the sample questions to get a sense of which one you feel more comfortable taking. Again, they're not radically different, but there are some, some differences in terms of how they're structured, how they're scored, um, that will be, might make a difference to you. Uh, so again, if you're trying to think about that, so just, just learning more just even from, from GMAC and from ETS about what their tests are and then and taking some simple questions I think can be very helpful. Great. So some questions around um, amount and, and type of work experience before coming um, to business school. Um, so sort of what, what are we looking for in terms of amount? Um, and then there's a question around what if my full-time experience doesn't align with my post-MBA goals, which we, sure. see, we see quite often. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, happy to start with those as well. Sure. Um, um, so in terms of the amount of experience, I think you'll probably hear this from other schools as well. You know, we don't have any formula, we don't have any set, you know, minimum or threshold or, or requirement in terms of the amount of experience. Amount of experience. We're really work looking at sort of the quality of the experience and, and sort of the nature of what you've been doing professionally um, you know, in your full-time work after you graduated from college. Um, so we're not counting years. Uh, we actually have a, a program called the Silver Scholars Program that is for students coming directly from their undergraduate to us here at Yale. Um, and it's different, it, it's different than other schools that have deferred admissions programs where you would apply as a senior in college and then work for a couple years and then go to business school. For us, Silver Scholars, um, you, know, you apply as a college senior and then you come directly to SOM uh, in the fall after you graduate. And so it's, it's not deferred admission, it's actually going straight from undergraduate to, to the MBA program. Uh, and actually you will end up getting your MBA in three years, which is actually less time than in other deferred admissions programs. Um, that's about 5% of our class, and I think partly informed by the Silver Scholars. You know, I think we are, you know, some schools you hear, you have to have a minimum two years of work experience. We're willing to, you know, look beyond that. And, you know, it's not common for people to have less than two years, but it's not as though we will not consider you, we will not look at you, and we will not, not think about, you know, what you can bring to the class. The same is for people, you know, with sort of 10 or more, say, years of work experience. You know, our average is probably four to five years out. Uh, I would say the mid 80% is probably two to seven years, but we do have people less than two, more than seven. Uh, it's kind of a bell curve, I would, uh, if you think about it. Um, and, and I think when we, when we talk to people about years of work experience, um, in addition to saying it's more about sort of the quality and the nature of the experience as opposed to the number of years, the, what, what, we, what we say is that, you know, the question is the same for everybody. Why do you want an, an MBA and why do you want it now? And it's just depending on where you are in your career path, that answer might be different, but we're open to, have, you know, being convinced by you, being you know, having telling you having you tell a compelling story, depending on wherever you are in your your uh, career prog progression, whether it's early on or whether it's with more experience or you know somewhere in between. Um, so that's a little bit about that yeah. in terms of the. I was terms. just going to jump on. You were talking about the sort of average tenure, um, yeah. you know, post undergrad. One of the uh, more new um, student clubs silver-haired scholars, um, which um, is like sort of the quote-unquote older than average. Um, so we definitely welcome um, a, a variety of, of folks who are most ready um, to, to go for the MBA and, and to Bruce's point, convincing us why, why now is the right time for you. Yeah. Great. And then I think the other question was sort of the, um, the pre-experience maybe not aligning with what they want to do. Oh, afterwards. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I can start with that if you have other thoughts sure. too. Um, so I think um, we talked a good bit about this. You know, we... You know, we ask for your post MBA uh, career goals or in in our application. We actually have a drop down and ask for the the short term and long term post MBA industries, and then just a little bit about so why uh, you know a little bit about why and what you've done to prepare for that you know, those those that career. Um, some of that is is just to understand trends and for for reporting. Um, we actually put very little stock in what you say you want to do after you graduate and, and whether that's even a sort of a, a pivot for you. Uh, we assume the, the two-year MBA is, a, you know, is, is very well suited to make that kind of career pivot. I, you know, the majority of our students are actually looking to go into a different role or different industry or both than they were in um, from, you know, before the, the MBA. And so that, that, that that career pivot is is very common. It's not something that is, is exceptional that we, that we find to be 
um, unusual among candidates. And especially because people tend to end up doing something different than they thought they were going to do when they applied to business school, we tend not to lean very heavily on what you say you want to do because we know that's likely going to change. And that's a very unstable data point for uh, upon which we would be making a decision. Uh, so we tend not to rely on that. We do, we, you know, when you explain sort of the reasoning behind the transition and sort of the things you've done to prepare, we look more at that because we want to get, it's not that we care about what you want to do, but we care more about how you're approaching and how you're thinking about it. So we, we use that information more to, to get at that aspect of your career interests, more, more about, and, and to, to get a sense of how you think about things and how you approach those kinds of situations, less about what it is you actually want to do, if that makes yeah. sense. I don't know if you have other things to add. No, it's excellent. Absolutely. So there's two more admissions questions, and then we'll shift uh, shift gears. Um, so I can take the, the first one. Um, the question's, you know, how important is the undergrad GPA? Um, so I, I spoke a little bit about the behavioral assessment um, as a potential um, offset or a different data point um, to help us um, sort of look at some in the classroom. Um, so that said, we do know that the undergrad GPA does predict, um, and I think it's one of the best predictors of, of success, both in the classroom and as a woman and business um, business leader in the future. So we certainly look at that. Um, we take a holistic view. Um, so while it's a brand, it's certainly not the only factor, um, and we don't have a certain cutoff. We've got um, you know our statistics on our website that sort of show where the admitted. Um, but there's no sort of standard number that we're looking for. Um, it is um, it, what I would recommend too is if there's anything that you're concerned about or feel like you need to explain to the caregiver um, to take the opportunity to do that through the optional essay. Um, if there was a you know extenuating circumstance or something going on in your life, um, or if you've um, to improve a in graduate courses, things like that also help give us confidence um, to kind of uh, circle back on, on the undergrad GPA. Yep. Um, a broader question, um, we always get this question, um, what are common mistakes um, in, in the application that we're aware of? Yeah, um, that's such a broad question and I think there are, um, you know, it could touch on any number of different things. Um, some very sort of, sort of Minute and detail in terms of you know some as obvious as typos or you know in you know, referencing the wrong school in an essay or elsewhere in the application. Obviously, those are not ideal things, um, and those are sort of you know again obvious and things you probably already you know are thinking about and aware of. I think um, in order if this is categorized it would be characterized as a mistake, um, but just in terms of approaching the the application. Generally, I think um, people, you know, I think applicants have a sense that, uh, you know, they're, they're being compared against some sort of ideal candidate that has, you know, you know sort of perfect across every dimension and you know, no weaknesses and, you know, no flaws. And as a result, uh, applicants feel like, sometimes feel like, feel the need to, you know, present themselves in that way. Obviously, you want to, you know, lead with your strengths, but, um, Sometimes so candidates will ignore the weaknesses or kind of gloss over things like employment gaps or you know a, a poor semester in undergraduate or short poor grades here or there. Um, and I don't think I think that's not always the wisest strategy. Uh, you know I think for for a number of reasons. One is we will see those things, um, and it's more beneficial to you if you are able to contextualize those aspects of your application on your terms as opposed to leaving it to us to try and figure it out and, and come up with. Some, some crazy explanation, maybe less charitable explanation than, than you would come up with that is actually the case. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece of it is that we are, you know, in addition to evaluating things like, you know, your academic and professional experience and potential, you know, we're also evaluating things like self-awareness and, and, and um, other traits. And so recognizing your weaknesses is an aspect of that. So I'm not saying you sort of go overboard in terms of, of flagging those things, but I think the, I, would, I don't know if it's technically a mistake, but I think it's a, maybe not the ideal strategy to, to ignore those things uh, in the application and, and to, to kind of hope that we're just not going to see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only other example I would give is, I think, is a theme that we've seen that sometimes um, people tend to um, underestimate certain parts of the application for others. Um, mm -hmm. And so someone might take time to craft the most Beautiful prose um, for the the essay um, essay question, and make sure it's it's super creative, and um, spend all of their time on that. Um, 
but then other parts of the application are, you know, there's less thought gone into that, or there's, we see typos, um, misspellings, things like that, that sort of show lack of attention to detail. So just know that we're sort of looking at things in a very balanced way, and that your story should tick and tie um, together and, and should represent all of you in the best light. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think one aspect of that in terms of, or variation of that in terms of sort of tying things together, I think another, again, to dwell on the mistakes, but I think applicants sometimes have a sense that they, you know, you need to present yourself a certain way depending on what the school is. That you know, this school is the finance school, that school is the marketing school, this school is the, uh, you know, operations school or the entrepreneurship school or whatever it is, and so you need to sort of be that candidate for for that school um, and be a different candidate for each school. And I think the two parts of that are, um, I think that might have been. A, a valid way to approach things or years ago, but I think all schools now are so interested in having diverse classes that you know they're not looking to just be all finance or all marketing or all you know all any one thing, uh, and so I don't think that that necessarily helps you. Uh, and I also think that it does you know to the extent when we look at applications, we're looking not just at what you say, but what the recommenders say and your experience and your interest. And if things don't seem to be lining up, that can be a flag for us. And so if you're trying to stretch too far to fit into you know, a particular school is what you perceive to be their, their area, and it kind of, it seems, it doesn't seem genuine. And I think that, that can definitely be a flag, even if you think that's helping you, it might actually have the opposite effect. Yeah, great. Okay, um, shifting gears a little bit here. So there's questions around opportunities for working um, with companies on practical projects mm -hmm. and or research. Um, so I'm sure we could both share a little bit there. Um, so I, I can start um, sure. and then you can jump in. Um, but um, lots of practical opportunities um, through courses um, and electives and through clubs um, to be able to um, take advantage of doing pro bono consulting, for instance, um, for organizations in the local New Haven community here, which we like to um, certainly partner with and give back to. Or um, Bruce had mentioned our global, some of our global opportunities. So we have GSE, which is Global Social Entrepreneurship, um, which is actually um, Partnering with uh, an organization in an emerging market um, and being, you know, actually doing that work, meeting with the business owners, and then going to that um, geography and, and helping them as well. Um, so lots of opportunities. And then I would say through through each of the um, professional clubs, um, they also give um, hands-on opportunity, especially for folks that are looking to kind of beef up their resume if they're making a career transition to be able to to tackle some of those practical approaches. Um, I don't know, for research perspective, um, in the curriculum, if you could talk to, about that a little bit. So um, in terms of sort of being able to do research with faculty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's definitely, I would, I would talk about that. And one other thing, so definitely we have students who come in and want, and want to work with faculty members uh, on sort of the research areas. Uh, and um, whether for credit or otherwise, um, I think you need to do certain things to, to make it for credit. Um, what I've heard from the faculty consistently is there's more, you know, there are more availability than there is um, interest among students. I think, uh, you know, faculty are always happy to work with students and have them help with the research, We're writing a book, working on articles or otherwise. Um, and so that's always, it's a matter of just finding a faculty member um, who's doing something that you're, you know, that you're interested in and, and sort of just partnering with them. So that's, that tends to be very much uh, an opportunity for students who are interested in that. Uh, the other thing I would mention in terms of experiential opportunities are um, the Yale Center for Customer Insights, YCCI, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is really uh, it's, uh, it's focused on our, our um, you know, marketing faculty. Um, they have what's called discovery projects, and that's where companies, so sort of Pepsi or Google or IBM, will come to, uh, come to them, to, to YCCI, uh, with a, a, a real world, a live project that they're working on. Um, the faculty will then solicit student interest and then the students and faculty will work together on these projects and it will end up usually pre presenting a report, maybe reporting to, doing a presentation to the, the company on the, the topic that you are, um, that they, they came to the school with. So those are very exciting projects that um, we've tried to replicate or start to replicate I think in, in other areas, but YCCI, the discovery projects are among the more popular opportunities, experiential opportunities that exist at the school. Yeah, great. Um, so we touched upon some of this, but another question or a few questions have come up around Again, the curriculum and the overall experience. Um, is SOM a management degree, a business degree? Um, why no tracks or specializations? Um, so I don't know if you want to start, and I can jump in if, if you want to. Yeah, I think um, so. When, when the school was founded, there was a lot of debate leading up to 
the founding of a school uh, within Yale and whether you know, Yale should, should have a business school, what that should be like, and that led to the, the, the founding mission of Educating Leaders for Business and Society, which is a much broader mission, as I said earlier. Um, very intentional for it to be a school of management and not business because when the, the school was founded, it, the, the degree was an MPPM, a Master's of Public and Private Management, um, as opposed to an MBA. Um, and the idea was that you know, was looking to train leaders broadly across sectors, not just in the for the for-profit sector and the private sector, but so nonprofit and public sectors as well. And historically, we've had so certain percentages of each class going into all three sectors uh, at various at varying degrees and at various levels. Um, so I think that's the that was the uh, it was very intentional. We in terms of sort of tracks or concentration, we used to have those um, and. Uh, with the integrated curriculum, those were um, so eliminated. The idea being that we, it is a general management school. We, we want our, our graduates to be prepared to lead in any in sector or industry they, they choose. And so the idea of concentrations seemed somewhat anth antithetical to that. There is talk about sort of reintroducing those in certain areas uh, and thinking about what that means. Uh, previously, it, you know, you'd only have to take three courses to concentrate in a particular area, and the thinking was that that was not sufficiently deep to really be a concentration. You could, some people train you know, three or four different things and that, didn't, that kind of seemed contrary to the idea of concentrating. So the school is looking at whether to, you know, bringing back certain concentrations and what the requirements would be for that. Um, but the general idea is that, you know, uh, the overall idea is we're a general management school uh, and management, you know, the idea of being management versus business is, is very intentional. Great. Um, so they're asking about our new dean, yeah. um, Kerwin, uh, who's, who's officially on board as of July 1st, um, and sort of what changes are we excited to, to see? Um, so I, I can start. Um, sure. And of course, there's a, a lot that we don't know yet. Um, we're really excited to um, get to know Kerwin um, as he comes on board. So um, if, you, if you're not aware, um, Kerwin Charles comes uh, to us from Chicago from the Public Policy School. Um, look him up. He has uh, amazing research, yeah. actually. Um, selfishly, since I'm in the diversity and inclusion space, he's done a lot of really amazing um, research and writing on inequities um, and socio socioeconomic um, inequalities. So I'm excited um, that he's going to bring that perspective to this school. Um, he came and, and, and spoke with uh, the community here in April, um, and he's very aligned with our mission. Um, so I don't think we foresee a lot of major changes or shifts to that um, or to the, the structure of the school in the short term. Um, I would just say one thing I think I'm excited about is that he seems very um, interested in, in really getting involved with the community um, domestically here. Um, Ted Snyder, who is our, our amazing um, outgoing dean, had really developed our global network and, and some of those partnerships. And because of that, um, was traveling quite often. Um, and so I think uh, a potential change could be that Kerwin is really going to be um, as visible as possible yeah. uh, on campus. I think that's right. Yeah. And I think he has really sort of Homed in on the mission and what the mission means, and he really, my sense is there will be a very, very so sort of thoughtful, and intentional uh, sort of evaluation of what the mission means and how we live that on a day-to-day -day basis, and and I think a, a time for self assessment, self reflection uh, across the the school for you know the among faculty, staff, students, alumni, um, and I think that's that'll be an interesting and I think a very healthy. Um, thing to, to, to do, and I think he's approaching, mm -hmm. he strikes me as, as, as you said, a very thoughtful person, and so she'll bring that thoughtfulness to the, yes. to the deanship generally, but to sort of thinking about sort of what, the, what the school's doing, what our priorities are, I think will be very exciting. Yes. He described his leadership style as a, a blend of humility and confidence, which mm -hmm. I just really loved <laughs> from an inclusive leadership perspective, so we're really excited about Kerwin. Yeah. Um, great. I mean, we can take one or two more, and then there are some specific questions here um, that we might not get to today. Um, I, I forgot to mention earlier, but we are hosting an application tips chat um, July 26th, um, and so registration is open for that, where um, I believe several of us on the admissions committee will be will be there to answer um, really specific questions about the admissions process. So I know there's some questions about um, particular experiences, particular um, programs, um, what's our interview process like, so certainly um, bring those questions there. Um, you can also um, send a note to our inbox, our email inbox, um, if we weren't able to answer your question today, and we'll make sure that we, we follow up as well. Um, so there's a, a question uh, a little bit more about our clubs again. Um, so talk about the clubs related to the different industries. What do they entail, and, and are they across all sectors? What, what do they um, provide? Mm. 
Um, so briefly, yes. <laughs> um, so I had mentioned earlier we have uh, 50 clubs, um, so a good, a good chunk of those are professional. They are listed on the website, so you can kind of go through, and, and each one has their own website with their mission and some of their main activities that they focus on. Um, but the professional clubs versus some of our social and, and affinity clubs, they really are career prep. Um, they work closely with the career development office um, and our employer really help ready students wanting to go into those industries. So whether it's consulting, finance, technology, healthcare, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of a, a broader um, array. They, they help um, organize career tracks. Um, they help do mock interviews and get you ready for whatever the um, recruiting cycle looks like, depending on that industry. So um, they're a huge lifeline for support. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I think that's, that's it in terms of questions that are coming through. Um, so I think we can kind of wrap up. Um, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time today. And we look forward to hopefully having a continued dialogue with you all. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very Have much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.